Okay. That, hopefully people will be able to hear me. If you can't, wave your hands in the back and I'll try to talk a little louder. Uh, in any case, uh, what I want to do today for the next 50 minutes is give you uh, a, an idea about the research that I was involved in that uh, got me this wonderful trip to Sweden and now got me this wonderful trip to Brasilia. And I want to take maybe a slightly different perspective of how to introduce the work. What I want to talk about is what happened to me as an elementary and high school student. I was very interested in science, and I heard lots of stories about famous scientists. And hearing these stories about Galileo and Copernicus and Einstein and Darwin, all these great scientists from the back, uh, from the past, I got an idea about what it meant to be a scientist, how scientists work, and I'm going to list those for you now, but the main lesson to take from these is all these things that I learned in the 50s and 1960s, all of them are wrong. It's not that they don't happen, but they don't have to happen. So what were the things that I was taught about who scientists are and how scientists uh, do their work. The first thing that I learned uh, in the 1960s was that all scientists are geniuses. They are a special class of people. If you're not a genius, don't even apply. <laughs> and if you, if you get convinced that you're not a genius, quit immediately, which is what happened to me when I was in college. The experiments didn't work at all. And I decided that the scientific ability was innate. Now, you often hear this also with sports stars, right? They have natural ability. Yeah, it's natural ability, but they practice like mad. And they, it's really what they do to make it seem like it's natural. The same thing happens with scientists. It's not that there's a natural ability to do science. It's that people actually work at it. The other thing that I learned about scientists were that uh, scientists' experiments work the first time all the time. So if your experiments don't work the first time, that's it. And for the most part, this does sometimes happen, but usually it doesn't happen. Uh, but that's what I got. And the reason is we like to tell scientific stories in a way that we don't want to take a lot of time. So we don't normally say, all the problems that someone had. They just, we just say the achievements that they've gotten. The other thing about scientists that I learned is that scientists, have, because they're geniuses, they have a peculiar way of thinking. And this way of thinking is called the scientific method. And that usually comprises an idea where you say, there's a problem I want to solve. And I have to think about that problem. And after some period of thought, you say, the scientist then says, I know what I can do to solve this problem. I'm going to do this experiment. And of course, the experiment works the first time, because they're geniuses. <laughs> and it, it, it just goes, and then they get all sorts of honor for this. The other thing about scientists, that until actually the late 1960s, when people started talking about Watson and Crick, all scientists worked alone. Now, if you watch enough movies, you know that even though they worked alone, they usually had an assistant named Igor. But other than that, that was it. Every scientist is a loner, doesn't work with people. That's not the way science is done. And the final thing about uh, what it meant to be, or how it, you became a scientist, is that all the examples I heard of, of the great scientists in the past, except for one person, and that was Marie Curie, all of them were white men. They're all European or of European descent. And if you weren't that, too bad. Or at least it seemed that. It actually, in the United States, George Washington Carver, and all the work he did with uh, peanuts and stuff, was about one of the few exceptions. So uh, what I'm going to tell you is a story about GFP, uh, green fluorescent protein. And I hope that by the time I finish the story, I will have convinced you that all of these things are not true. Some of them are true some of the time, but they're not true all of the time. 
So my involvement with this wonderful protein that came from a jellyfish has absolutely nothing to do with the protein or the jellyfish. I have spent most of my academic career looking at this small one millimeter long worm called Centerobditis elegans. And I study the sense of touch in this animal and mutants that are no longer able to sense touch. And I would be happy to give another three or four hours of lecture on that, but I, I'm going to stop myself and simply say that we found mutants that were insensitive to touch. And using molecular biology, we were able to clone the DNA of the mutated genes. And the first, one of the first questions you ask once you have cloned DNA is what cells activate that gene? What cells turn the gene on? And we needed to have a way of doing that. And we were fortunate because there were many ways to look at whether a gene was active or not. And in fact, we used three of them. DNA makes RNA makes protein. You make an antibody against the protein. And wherever that protein is made, you'll see where it is. Another way, uh, the one on the bottom, is to look at the RNA that's made by a method called in situ hybridization. And wherever it was, you could see the dots of the cells that made that RNA, and you knew this gene was active there. Or you could use uh, constructs such that the gene would be active, if the gene was activated, it wouldn't turn on its normal protein, but it would turn on a protein, the production of a protein that you could characterize or you could see. In this case, we use the beta-galactosidase uh, producing gene, LACZ from E. coli. Uh, actually, this was a method that was developed in the early 1960s by Malcolm Casataban, which turned out to be very, very useful. And so we had methods to answer the question. And we answered the question. It was in the touch sensing cells or it was in another set of cells. So there was no problem that we were trying to solve. I wasn't interested in a problem. We were doing it. So there was no driving problem there. But there is, this slide actually points out a couple of things. The first thing is that this animal is transparent. That's a very important part in the story. And the second part is that we were asking the question, where are genes active? So that's all that I brought when I went to a seminar in 1989 and listened to a seminar. And the beginning of the seminar described the work of this man, Osamu Shimomura, who shared the Nobel Prize in 2008 with me. And it was talking about Shimamura's work with this jellyfish, Aquaria Victoria. I had heard about some of the work, but not the punchline of, of the work. And I certainly didn't know anything about how he had done his experiments. So I urge you, if you have a half an hour to spare, go to the nobelprize.org website and listen to his 29-minute acceptance speech. Because his story about how he became a scientist is astonishing. So when he was 16, he's told, sorry, you have to quit high school. You can't be in school anymore. You have to work in a factory. It was a paint factory. And it was outside the city he lived in. It was over the mountains in the adjacent valley. So that was it. School was done. He had to work in a factory. And the reason for this was that the year was 1945, and the town was Nagasaki, Japan. And so he could not continue his education. This turned out actually to be pretty good for him because the mountains between where he was working and the city protected him when the atomic bomb destroyed the city. But afterwards, although he came in and he helped people, tried to rescue them, uh, there was no college to go to. The college had been destroyed. And it was after several years that they finally rebuilt part of the college. And he went to that. It was the pharmacy school. He wasn't necessarily interested in going to pharmacy school, but it was the only college he could go to. He then went to, uh, after he graduated from college, he got a job as a laboratory technician at Nagoya University. And he was given a project that they didn't know how this worked. He gets it to work. And this leads to two consequences. 
The first consequence is he's invited to come to the United States to do some research in a lab in Princeton. And the second is he got an unusual going away present from the head of the lab that he had been working with. His going away present was his PhD. So that's what he got, did all this work. He got that as the going away present. He came to the United States and uh, started working and went to Friday Harbor Lab in the, on the west coast of the United States to try to answer the question, how is it that this jellyfish produces light? To try to do the biochemistry of that. And this is where the scientific method comes in. So you have to listen carefully to this part. He starts doing the experiments. He collects hundreds of the jellyfish. He grinds them up. He tries to isolate the protein. Nothing works. The whole summer, failure after failure after failure. And when finally, he's, one day he's working really late at night. It's already gotten dark outside. I think he hadn't had dinner. He wanted to go home. The experiment failed another time. And so he decides, that's it for today, another day of failure. I'm going to, I'll just clean up. I, I'll just clean up and go home. So he takes the samples and he throws them in the sink. And the sink had some overflow from some tanks, some seawater in it, some jellyfish parts, other stuff in it. <laughs> and he throws it in the sink and he goes to walk out. He turns off the light and he happens to look back at the sink and the sink is glowing. And he, he looks at it and says, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> I want to point out that biochemists are often known for having experiments work when they throw their stuff on the floor, in the sink, <laughs> different places like that. It's a nice part of the scientific method. And he goes and he looks at, at, at this thing and says, there must be something in the sink that was important here. And he reasoned that the one thing that was in the seawater that was not in his samples was calcium. So he goes back to the lab later after a couple of days and does the experiment again and finds that if he adds calcium, he can generate light to the prep. And he uses that to purify the protein, which he names after the jellyfish. Uh, he calls it a quorum. This actually turned out to be the first calcium indicator that anyone ever had, and people used it biologically for many years. But he had a problem. So the first accident was throwing things in the sink and having it work, nice procedure. The second problem was the jellyfish produced a green light but a quorum produced a blue light. So he found the molecule that generated light, it just didn't generate the right color. So with that accidental discovery, he goes and says, there must be something else. There must be a protein that converts blue light to green light. It doesn't generate light, it just converts it. And that's, after all, what fluorescence is. Fluorescence is bringing in light of one wavelength and getting light out of another wavelength. And so he goes by, he goes to all of his samples and he tries to look at them with an ultraviolet lamp to stimulate them and he finds one that when he stimulates it, it, get, it gives him back green light. He writes about this in his 1962 paper in footnote number three. He says, yeah, the, the whole paper is about a corn, but the footnote number three says, I found this other protein and it's, I call it the green protein. We now call it GFP or the green fluorescent protein. And he described it. And as far as I know, this is the only footnote that ever won its writer a Nobel Prize. <laughs> because what he found is that with GFP, along with all the rest, then the, he could generate green light. So he was able to answer the question how the animal produced green light. It was actually two different proteins, a corn, GFP, plus calcium. Now you have to remember, I'm listening to a seminar about this. I work on a transparent animal and I want to know where genes are expressed. And someone has just told me that there is this molecule that all you have to do is shine blue light on it and you get green light. And I realize that this is a lantern. Now all we have to do is have our genes make this thing and we're, we're going to be able to look at the cells in the living animal and know where the genes are expressed. I should have mentioned before a couple of things. One is that those other methods, you had to fix the animals, they were dead. You had to permeabilize them to get the reagents into them. 
So we got a static view of life. What we really want is a more dynamic view of life. And this would do it because now we wouldn't try to get chemicals into them. We'd just shine blue light. And we'd be able to see wherever the GFP was made because it would be green. So I got very excited, and as was mentioned earlier today, I have no memory whatsoever about the rest of the seminar. I just started fantasizing about what experiments I wanted to do and got very excited. And the next day, uh, I want to point out one thing. Uh, notice that his name is written in black, right? Uh, the next day, I called up and, and got associated with Douglas Prasher, whose name is in blue, uh, and we set up a collaboration because Douglas was the person who was in the process of identifying the DNA for green fluorescent protein. And I wanted to put that into the worms. We had some problems, which I won't go into now, about getting out of touch with each other for about three years. But in September of 1992, a new graduate student, Gia Skirkin, whose name is in red, uh, was, uh, joined the lab. And she had already gotten a master's degree in chemical engineering and working on fluorescence. So I thought, this is the perfect person to work on this project. If Douglas had only sent us the DNA, we would be able to do it. And we found that, in fact, he had done it, but we had lost track of each other. We got back in touch with each other. And about two or three days after she started graduate school, Gia set off to do the experiment. One month after she started graduate school, this is a page from her lab notebook. And what I've circled is the part that says that she was able to get strongly fluorescing E. coli. She was able to put the DNA for GFP into the cells. And as this picture, which was taken that first night that she was able to see this, shows she had green fluorescent E. coli. We were very, very excited. Now, uh, I'm going to say well, one other thing about this page from her lab book, but I want to explain why people's names are in different colors. Anyone that you see whose name is in red is someone that worked in my laboratory. Anyone whose name is in blue is a collaborator. Anyone whose name is in black did something I wish I had done instead. <laughs> so if we look at this page, one of the things that's very interesting about this page from her lab notebook is this part up here where she says that she used the microscope, not in our lab, but in the old lab, the, the lab she had gotten her master's degree in, in our engineering school. And the reason for this is that the microscope we had in the lab was a piece of junk. <laughs> and she tried it, and she wasn't sure if the experiment worked or not, but she was smart enough to realize that she knew where there was a much better microscope. So we, she went to the other place, and that's, that's where she took this picture. But I hope you can understand that this presented us with a real obstacle to doing the experiments. We couldn't continue to use that microscope because they had experiments they wanted to do. In fact, nobody would let us use their microscope. And so we didn't have a microscope to continue the experiments. What, the way I solved that is I called up all the sales representatives of the different microscope companies and I said, look, we've just developed a new way to look at gene expression. We're very excited. It uses fluorescence. And I got to buy a new microscope. But before I do, I need to try it out. I'm not sure if yours is going to work. So if you could bring it by and let us use it for a month or two, that would be really nice. <laughs> we'll give it a good workout. And so everything we did was on borrowed microscopes. And actually, if you look in our paper, you'll see a part that says, there's a footnote that says, GFP can be seen with the following microscopes. That's, that's a thank you of all the microscopes we borrowed from various people and the various companies. In any case, we were very excited about this. Um, it, this is a case where the experiment worked the first time. And as I was telling some of the students earlier, this turned out to be very important because people knew that GFP, the protein, underwent a rather unusual rearrangement. Normally, proteins are long polypeptide chains of amino acids, a linear chain. But this one actually forms another cycle in it. There's a five-membered ring that's made. No one knew how that was done. 
but everyone thought it's going to be done by some other means. There's got to be another enzyme that does this work to reform the molecule. And we put this in, and we didn't add anything else from the jellyfish, so that wasn't true. But that was the prevailing idea. Three other groups tried this experiment, but they did it in a way that it wouldn't work. They included some extra bits that actually interfered with it. And as a result, their experiments didn't work, and they concluded, oh, it must need something else. So we were very fortunate in sort of the way we chose to do the experiments. And not only seeing that we could get it into bacteria, we also put it into worms. And uh, we decided we wanted to send the paper off for publication. And this was 1993 or so. It was published in 1994. We sent it to the journal Science. We sent it to the journal Science for one reason and one reason only. We didn't want to send it to a genetics journal or a cell biology journal or a developmental biology journal. We wanted to send it to a journal that was general because we thought this was going to be useful in many, many areas of science. And so we sent it to science because they had a very broad uh, audience that uh, read the journal. And it did, in fact, get uh, published in science, but not without some problems. So I want to talk a little bit, just you know, about three or four minutes, about the problems of scientific publication that I believe everyone has. So if you ever try to send a paper to science, um, you will learn very quickly that the, editorial, the editors of science think extremely highly of themselves <laughs> and their journal. And they have to first approve the journal article as being worthy to be sent out for review. And so you it's sort of a gauntlet you have to go through. And so we sent it, and I got a phone call from the editors, and they said, well, seems like an interesting paper, but we're not sending it out for review. And I said, why not? And they said, well, frankly, we don't like the title. <laughs> That was a little strange, because uh, this was the title, Green Fluorescent Protein, A New Marker for Gene Expression. Pithy, said the right things, it was all wonderful. And I said, what's wrong with the title? And they said, well, you see, everything in the journal Science is new. You cannot use that word in the title. <laughs> I said, if I change the title, will you send it out for review? And I think they said maybe, I'm not really sure. <laughs> but they did do it. But I am a person, and I, maybe I shouldn't admit this, I really don't like to be told what to do. I get a little angry. I get a little revengeful. <laughs> and so the title that I submitted with the paper when it went out to reviewers was the following title, which is a little extensive. It's, the Aquaria Victoria green fluorescent protein needs no exogenously added component to produce a fluorescent product in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. This is actually the whole paper right here. That, 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 that's it. You could put the figures in the title, and, and that would have been it. And uh, the reviewers actually were very favorable. It was very nice. And it was decided that they would publish it. And the copy editor calls me up as they're going through the, the publication procedure. And the copy editor says, do you know that your title is a bit long? <laughs> and, and, and I said, actually, I do. And so he said, is, it, is it at all possible that you could shorten the title? And I said, yeah, let me work on it, which well, of course it was. And the title eventually became Green Fluorescent Protein as a Marker for Gene Expression. And that's the official title of the paper. Now, the other problem we had with publication has to do with this picture that did go on the cover. And this is an enhanced picture uh, for, for this slide. You see this bright green cell that's going down the length of the animal. That's a nerve cell in the process of growing. So all that furry stuff at the end is the growth cone. The, the, so I wanted this picture, which is of a living animal, to show that we could actually watch biology happen. Now, the problem here was the art editor called me up. I really like your picture, except there's one color we don't like on the cover, and that's green. Can we change the color? <laughs> and I said, 
absolutely not. There was a little back and forth, but I won. But if you actually do get a chance to look at the real cover, it's really washed out and it looks pretty ugly. But it was, it was there and I, I was appreciative. The third problem that comes from this, oops, let's go on from here. The third problem is the fact that we had already been giving away samples of the DNA to other people to try. And they were already getting back to me and saying, it works. It works in this system or that, it works in fruit fly, it works in zebrafish, it works in uh, mouse cells and culture, other cells and culture. Uh, and it was dictyostelium, it was very exciting. And so I wanted to have in the paper, look, it's not just worms and bacteria, it's all these other cells, it's gonna work everywhere, don't worry about it. And I asked people, can I have your permission to talk about your unpublished work? And they said, well, you gave us this way before you published anything about it. Of course you can, except for one person. The one person was a bit demanding. In fact, you can't really see her letter, but it's outlined here. I had to make coffee every Saturday morning for uh, two months. I had to prepare a special French dinner at a time of my choosing, and I had to take out the garbage nightly for a month. This is my wife. <laughs> and what Tula had done, though, was really quite wonderful, because while we had shown that you could take a genes promoter and activate GFP production, which is technically called a, trans, a, a transcriptional fusion, she had taken the whole gene that she was interested in Drosophila, the promoter, the protein coding sequence, and then the protein coding sequence of GFP, and actually put that lantern on the protein and could watch it. And she is interested in the early development of fruit flies. And in the early development, uh, this is the developing oocyte here. And the, the, her protein was made in these cells called the nurse cells, and she could watch the protein after it was made in these cells being transported through these ring canals into the developing oocyte and then come to lie along this edge and along this edge here. And so she was actually able to watch protein moving in the cells. And that was very exciting. And I wanted to use her work. So uh, I should tell you, this is not the letter she sent to science, which just simply said, yes, he can do it. I'm sorry, but this is the one she gave me, and she still says I haven't paid up. But um, <laughs> in any case, why was GFP so exciting to use, and what made its properties so wonderful to, to, for people? The first is that you bring GFP into the animal by transforming it, by putting the DNA for GFP in. And once you've done that, not only does that organism make the protein, but its progeny make the protein as well. So you develop lines that you can then do studies that you normally could never work on. Remember all those other procedures, you had to kill the animal, fix it, permeabilize it. Once you did that, you just had to do it all over again. Looking at GFP is pretty safe, very innocuous. All you have to do is shine blue light on it, which most organisms don't have a problem with, and you get green. So it's not going to, for the most part, it's not going to interfere with biology. So it's a, basically a non-invasive way of watching things happen. Finally, as, or not finally, but uh, in addition, it's a small, relatively small molecule. It's 238 uh, amino acids, and it works as a monomer, and the beta-galactosidase that I pointed out in that other slide, that has a molecular weight in the active tetramer that's 16 times larger. So beta-galactosidase doesn't get out of the cell body. GFP gives everywhere because it's small enough to diffuse everywhere. And so it allows people to see entire cells. And finally, as I've pointed out a couple of times, it allows you to see life as it's happening. It gives you a dynamic way of looking at biology. And to show you some examples, uh, here we have uh, the entire nervous system of this worm we work on, outlined in GFP. This is a canola plant, that's fruit fly. This, these are mice, this is zebrafish. And this is Alba, the GFP bunny. Alba was commissioned by the uh, Brazilian artist who now lives in Chicago, Eduardo Koch, uh, who uh, 
wanted to go to his various art shows and present Elba as an example of the coming together of art and technology or art and science. And so he would use this as a talking point. It was a family pet for many years. Over here on the right, we have a variety of cells. And what I really want to point out is this Purkinje cell in the cerebellum of a mouse. And you can see that the GFP has gone to all the parts of the cell, really allowing you to see the full extent of the, that cell at one time. Now, what I've said repeatedly is that this allows you to see things dynamically. I want to show you two quick movies uh, that do this. And just to explain them, uh, we have, uh, this is cell division. And when a cell divides, or when a nucleus divides, because I'm actually going to show you pictures where only the nuclei divide. When it divides, the nuclear envelope breaks down. The chromosomes separate on the spindle. And when it's all over, nuclei reform. So during the division process, you make a spindle, but you don't have that at other times. And you've gotten rid of the nucleus, which you make out at the periods outside that. Okay? So both of these movies were made by Rosalind Silverman Gavrilla, who I believe was a graduate student at the time in Canada. And uh, she posted these on the web. And I'm not really sure why one of them is slightly off the screen. But this is the one in which GFP has been put in a protein that is part of the spindle. And so you're going to see the spindle forming in this embryo of Drosophila. There are no cell boundaries. It's just nuclei that can constantly divide. So let me start that movie. See the spindle? Now this is very speeded up. It's very rapid. Uh, and it, it will go through several things. And I hope what you're seeing here is how astonishingly synchronized this is, that all of the nuclei are dividing together. We have another one here. And so this will loop through here so you can see it again. But that immediately introduces the question, what coordinates this? How do all these nuclei get associated in some way with each other so all of this happens. We know quite a lot about the, the uh, activity and what's needed. Now, on the right-hand side, we have a small polypeptide, or small peptide, that's attached to GFP. And this peptide is called a nuclear localization signal. This peptide, if you have this peptide attached to anything, that thing will get sucked up into the nucleus. So we expect it to be in nuclei when there's no division, but we expect it all over the embryo during the division because the nuclei have broken down. And then when the nuclei reform, it should go back into them. And you see here that this is in color. This is just GFP, but it's falsely colored because and the convention is you go through the rainbow, and if you're at the blue end, you have less. Then you have more with green, more with yellow, more with orange, and a lot with red. So you can see here that some of these nuclei are basically blue, some of them are green, some of them are sort of red-orange uh, here. So they have different amounts of GFP. And while she calls this movie in synchrony, which is a nice name for it, this movie she names after the Van Gogh painting Starry Night. And I think you'll see why in a second. So now the nuclei are all breaking down, and the GFP is all over the embryo. The nuclei are going to reform, I hope. There we go. And now everything's being sucked up into the nuclei. And then they break down again. Again, this is very, oops, sorry about that, very speeded up. I get excited about this. <laughs> and what I hope you notice here is that it's not synchronous. It's going as a wave across the field that you're seeing, except it's a very similar embryo to the one on the left. Now, what's the difference here? Well, we don't know for sure, but we actually believe that the one on the right, the cover slip under the microscope, has been pushed down a little too heavy. And so the, the cell is trying to be synchronous, but it's not working. So this actually turns out to be a very sensitive way to say, your prep is no good. But it does, it, and, but it's just a beautiful movie. 
Uh, in my lab, we have used GFP to uh, look at a number of different things. We look at gene expression. We look at where proteins are localized. We label cells and then isolate the cells because they have the fluorescence of GFP and nothing else does, so we can isolate the cells. But I think one of the main things we do in my lab is we take an animal that only has GFP in the touch sensing cells and then we mutate it. And we start to ask questions that I think are fundamental for nerve development. How do you get the right number? How do you get the cells in the right place? How do you get the cells to have a process that grows in one particular direction and not another? All of these questions are fundamental problems in the nervous system and all we have to do is mutate the animal and look for things that are unusual. Multiple processes, cells in the wrong place, multiple cells, all of these allow us to do things. Now, this has been very wonderful for us and for many other people, but you know, scientists are basically unhappy. <laughs> you give them, you know, it's, it's like the, there's, a, there's a children's book in the United States, if you give a mouse a cookie, it'll ask you for a glass of milk. Well, if you give scientists GFP, they're gonna say, okay, more colors, please. And the person who did that was the third person to share the prize with us, uh, and that is Roger Chen, who made a whole bunch of different colors, and he named them after, um, he didn't like to use letters. He wanted to name these after fruits. So I think this is blueberry, and that's melon, that's lime, uh, that's either banana or something like that. That's orange, and that's either tomato or cherry. I'm not sure which one, but he has many more. There's about 15 colors that his lab was able to generate. They also did other wonderful experiments that I don't have time to do, uh, making molecular monitors within cells that use properties of the fluorescence of the molecule. It made just wonderful uh, new tools that could then be inherited and studied in the same way. But one of the most astonishing uses of this technology was done uh, by Josh Sainz and Jeff Lickman at Harvard, who wanted to look at the nervous system of the mouse, the central nervous system of the mouse. And they wanted to use all these wonderful colors, except they actually used only four colors, but they, the four colors span the entire spectrum. And so if you're gonna have something that you wanna look at the central nervous system, and it has every color imaginable, there's actually only one name for that, at least in English, and that's brainbow. <laughs> and so uh, this, these are some of their rather spectacular pictures that they were able to do. Now GFP has been used in a number of different ways. It's been estimated that there have probably been 160,000 papers using fluorescent proteins since we published our paper 20 years ago, which is sort of staggering. I have not read them all. No. But nonetheless, GFP has been used in a number of ways. One that I would call basic or fundamental, so that we are looking at gene expression, protein localization, using it for mutational analysis, and so on, to be able to understand biology. It's also been used in an applied way to investigate problems in medicine and health by looking at processes such as metastases or how uh, HIV is transmitted between cells or looking at in, uh, using it to study inherited disease and so on. It's been used in drug discovery and in biotechnology in general. And it's been used to make some biosensors and I'll show you one of those. And finally, it has had some unexpected consequences uh, I would say new uh, research, in fact, people have gone off and said, well, if there's GFP, there must be other fluorescent proteins, and they found spectacular fluorescent proteins out there uh, that have been different, uh, and um, Carl Dieseroff, who uh, developed these wonderful new methods uh, for optogenetics, told me that it was because of GFP uh, that was in a, a, a jellyfish that he went off to try to find some molecules that actually could change nerve cell activity by light, and with, this was one of his motivations for it. I've put industry, and I, I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, in, um, after the Nobel Prize, I was asked to give a talk to a group, and uh, one of the people at, at, at the end uh, was the president of Zeiss Microscopes. And he gets up and he says, Marty, 
You don't know this, but in 1994, before your paper was published, Zeiss microscopes were thinking of stopping the production of fluorescent microscopes. We just didn't think it was worthwhile for the com company to keep doing that. And then your paper came out, and everyone needed a fluorescent microscope. So I want to thank you for saving our country, our company. And I said, great, that means you're going to give me a microscope? He said, no. <laughs> so, and I've already told you a little bit of art, but let me give you a couple more examples. So the way the textbooks describe viruses and how viruses get spread from one cell to another is a cell is infected by a virus, and then the cell breaks open, the viruses go everywhere and infects other cells. And of course, if that were the case, you could make an antibody against them, and that would scarf them up, and you wouldn't have to worry about it. But that doesn't seem to always be the case with HIV. And so there's this very nice experiment that was done in which here's a cell where the virus is labeled with GFP, and here's a non-infected cell, and there's a particle, and it's not being spewed out of a lysing cell, it just is transferred. It's one cell kissing the other and transferring the virus into the other cell. This immediately has implications on how you want to think about treatment and being able to watch this, these are mouse cells in culture, uh, influences how you then think about the next experiments. One interesting thing with biosensors was some work by a guy named Bob Burledge at Oak Ridge National Lab. Bob decided to do a rather crazy experiment, wonderful experiment. The experiment was take a gene that he knew about in bacteria that was activated by the explosive TNT. And every time TNT was in the area, the bacteria would make GFP and glow green. So he did this. He put it in, and it worked great. Put it on the Petri dish, put TNT in the Petri dish, he got green fluorescent E. coli. And then because he was at the Oak Ridge National Lab, he was able to have a friend take five landmines, landmines usually leak TNT, and bury these in a three by five meter plot of land. Once he did, they, his friend did it. Now, they're not stupid scientists. These were not connected. They had TNT, but they did, were not connected landmines. He went and he sprayed the bacteria on the plot of land and came back either that night or in a couple of nights uh, with a UV lamp and was able to see where the landmines had been buried because they had leaked TNT. Now, there's been some problems with this, but I know of at least three groups that have done similar experiments with similar results. There's some cross-reactivity, so it's not clear it's going to work, but I love the idea that he used GFP to do something that would really help people because these landmines usually get the non-combatants and well after there's been the combatants have left the area. And if there was a way of detecting these mines without hurting people, that would be quite wonderful. So I, I, I applaud the effort. It's not quite there yet, but I really like it. Other things that have happened, there's a group in Japan they work on silk moths. So they decided to add GFP to silk fibroin and uh, make uh, fluorescent silk. And they've made some clothing. They've given me a tie that I, I, don't, I don't have on now, but uh, a green fluorescent tie from green fluorescent silk. And one final thing that happened, you know, sometimes people ask me the question, well, has this been put into people? I actually heard that there may be uh, an experiment right now uh, testing a virus uh, in people and it may have been injected to see that the virus got in. They, they've actually put GFP in it. But that, I don't know if that's published yet and I'm still waiting to hear more about the results. But there was one attempt and which may be the first human transgenic with GFP and that's this guy. <laughs> At the beginning of the movie Hulk by Ang Lee, there's a jellyfish, nicely fluorescing. And a hypodermic needle comes in and just sucks the GFP right out of it. And of course, that gets injected into Bruce Banner, who then becomes the Hulk, because the gene, GFP obviously went into a gene that gets turned on with anger, and his skin turns green. And I happen to know the screenwriter for this, because he's at Columbia University in our School of Arts. And I went to him and I said, how did you know about my work? This is wonderful. 
And he said, I have no idea what you do. And I said, no, the GFP. He said, oh, that. We had a student from MIT who was working on the set, and he convinced us to do this. <laughs> Fine. Let me finish by saying, so I hope, as I said at the beginning, that I've convinced you that GFP, the story of GFP, does not have all those hallmarks that I said that I learned about scientists. Let me tell you what I think I have learned about GFP. So first, I think scientific success comes in many different ways, from many different ways. I told you about Shimamura's pa uh, pathway to this. Roger Chen, we have a contest in the United States called, it used to be called the Westinghouse Science Talent Search, and then was called, it's now called the Intel Science Talent Search. It picks the very best of the very best high school students that have done spectacular science projects. Roger Chen won that. Just amazing, and he's done amazing experiments ever since. So just wonderful, wonderful experiments. So he really is that person that from a very early age showed incredible promise. I am not showing my college grades at this talk uh, for good reason. Uh, they are not stellar. I, I don't think it made any difference. I think the thing that unites the three of us is the fact that we really are passionate and excited about the research that we do. And I think that's the important thing, not what grade you got in something, but really what you like more than anything else. The second thing that I think I've learned is that many, if not most, discoveries are accidental. Now, I told you about GFP, right? Or a corn was discovered by throwing it in the sink, a definite accidental discovery. Many of the stories here, but being able to walk into that seminar, having worked on a transparent animal and have somebody say, this thing will give you light, that was a wonderful accident and led us to, to doing this. It wasn't the case where we had an idea, we must figure out a way of looking at gene expression. We had it, but this just looked like a much better opportunity. The physicist Enrico Fermi has a wonderful phrase that, uh, that goes something on the order of, if you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, then you have made a measurement. But if you do an experiment and it does not confirm your hypothesis, then you've made a discovery. Now, of course, you've got to do a lot of experiments to get both, but uh, it, the discoveries are what I think push the science ahead, and so uh, I, I think they're very important. Third point, I think it's really important to be ignorant, stubborn, and just have a willingness to try experiments. If we had listened to all the people about GFP needing a converting enzyme, we wouldn't have done the experiment. Now, a lot of people, uh, Oliver Smithies, uh, among others, uh, have said that you have to play in the lab. I like to talk about it as a, a weekend experiment. This is an experiment you do Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. A time when no one else is in the lab because you're embarrassed <laughs> to admit that you're going to try this really nutty experiment. But you just have to try it anyway. And so you do the experiment. If it works, you crow about it on Monday morning. If it doesn't work, you just ask people how their weekend went. <laughs> Fine. But you, got, you have to try this. The next point. I think that scientific progress is not the work of individual people. And I'm very grateful that the Nobel gave me this honor. But they can only honor at most three people. But the story of GFP actually involves thousands. And I've, talked about people like Douglas Prasher and Gia Skirkin and my wife, Tula Hazelrig, that I feel personally could have equally been awarded the prize or shared in the prize. But it goes way beyond those six people because it really is the thousands of people that have done it. And in fact, I like to think about the way we do science as very similar to what happens with fluorescent proteins. Fluorescent proteins take on color or light of one wavelength and then convert it, give off energy, light of a different wavelength. And we do the same thing. We take the observations and experiments done by others and modify them by our own thoughts and experiments and modify them so then we have a new piece of information that goes out that gets handed off to somebody else to do that in turn. So it's a cumulative process that's involved here. 
involving thousands of people. If we had just done the experiments, there wouldn't have been any impact. It was really all those other people that did all the really cool stuff that really made this uh, something that was prize-worthy. I think that the story involving this jellyfish, our work with a worm that at the time no one really cared that much about, says that all life should be studied, not just a few model organisms, not just a few things. And especially with the biodiversity here in Brazil, this is a wonderful opportunity to learn a lot more biology. And I think at least the lesson for me is that that's important. And my final point is that while this has had applications and all sorts of other implications here, it really started off with basic research. And so my last point is that basic research is essential for any scientific enterprise. I'm not opposed to applying research. I'm just very worried that some governments, some people feel we've learned enough. Now is time just to apply what we've learned to these things. When in fact, we need to keep the pipeline going. We need to make these discoveries. And we are making discoveries every year that are changing the way we think about science. And it's incredibly important. We are nowhere near knowing things. One example I like to give is that we still, we know there's approximately 20,000 genes, 30,000, 20 to 30,000 genes in the human genome. Unfortunately, most of them encode proteins labeled as proteins of unknown function. We have no idea what they do. So we are really woefully ignorant, and there's a lot of opportunities. And I want to end with a, a, a favorite quote of mine that deals with basic research and the importance of it. And that is a, a quote by Robert R. Wilson. Robert Wilson was a physicist, an architect, and a sculptor. And he was the first head of the Fermi uh, lab in Batavia, Illinois, which was until the CERN lab went online, the CERN super collider went online, uh, it was the largest particle accelerator in the world. And it made wonderful discoveries. But in 1969, he was asked to go and talk to members of Congress to convince them that the government should pay all this money for this science fair project of his to build this accelerator. And so he's asked to come and talk. And he's, he, he goes there, and one of the senators, uh, who is very in favor of the project, thought he would ask him a very simple question. He said, Dr. Wilson, can you tell us how many ways this accelerator will assist national security? I should tell you, 1969 is the middle of the Vietnam War in the United States. National security is something that people are thinking about a lot. And Wilson thinks about the question and says, none. <laughs> Not the answer that the senator wanted. So he asked him a second time and gets the same answer, none. And finally he says, no, really, Dr. Wilson, in what respect will this work? help or aid the national defense. And Wilson says the following. He says, it has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with whether we are good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country except to make it worth defending. Thank you very much. Hello, Professor. I am a PhD student here at the university. I'd like to ask two basic questions regarding uh, all the context of our research. Well, the first one is, uh, would you have any advice for, uh, for how to manage a, a research lab or a research group? I mean, you obviously know a lot of uh, research groups and labs, and what are the key mistakes that you see that they make that 
maybe we also do and we can correct it. So that, that's the first question. And the second question would be, uh, it seems to me that uh, there's a lot of pressure upon us to make uh, scientific articles and to, to make uh, articles in journals or in congress and in conferences. And uh, my impression is that sometimes it, it, it mitigates um, how good the, the works uh, are because people focus on numbers instead of focusing on quality. I mean, what, what, what's your point of view in, some, I mean, did you ever get to GPL by just wanting to, to publish, of course not? I mean, what would be your, your answer? Great. So, okay, so I'll try to do this very quickly. Um, the first question about how to set up a lab, I'm not sure I know that. <laughs> in truth, I can tell you that I, I, when I was a graduate student, I was in a lab where the head of the lab, uh, who is still a very dear friend, and I would talk about experiments every single day. And at night, when he would go home to his family, he would say, you have to call me. 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, I don't care. You have to call me with the result. And that set up what we were going to do the next day. And we talked about it, and I learned an enormous amount from him for doing that. Then I went and did a postdoc. I did a postdoc uh, with Sidney Brenner, who won the Nobel Prize in 2002. And I worked with John Solston, who shared that prize. And Sydney was a very interesting postdoctoral advisor. I was there for five years. I talked to Sydney five times in those five years. He said, here's the environment. And it was just wonderful people to talk with. And wonderful people to do experiments. And he basically said, you're free to do it. And that was a wonderful time for me because I, you know, in the lab, the molecular biology lab in Cambridge, England, was a place that had outstanding researchers. And it had fabulous, fabulous uh, reagents and supplies and shops and equipment. Everything was there. That's scary. Because suddenly you realize, you wake up one day and you say, if, I do, if this doesn't work, it's because of me. And Having that, one, that freedom, and also that ability, you know, that, that feeling of, I've got to make this on my own, I, I, was very good for me and very good for several other people. There were other people that just could not easily adjust to that. So it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, I like to give people as much freedom in my lab as possible. Uh, I don't know if that's good or not, but we've had some good stuff over the years, and uh, they've they've done well, so I, I, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer to that. In terms of this problem um, about numbers, and which I will redefine as impact factor, which people usually talk about, and uh, how one values the science, impact factor started as a numerical means to help school librarians, because the librarians only are given a set budget. And if they're given a set budget, do they want to get a journal that 100 people will be reading? Or do they want to get a journal that maybe one person will read every five years? And the option is, OK, you take the one that's 100. Nothing about the quality of the work in the journal, simply that people read it or not. Not any quality of it. Unfortunately. Universities, institutes, hiring groups, tenure review committees started looking at this and said, wow, this is great. We don't have to do any thinking. We can just put a number on this. We can use this number. And if they have a high impact factor, that means the paper must be really good. I clearly don't agree with that. A number of people don't agree with that. There, last year, uh, through the American Society for Cell Biology, uh, there was an initiative called DORA, the Declaration of Research Appraisal, uh, which basically said, don't do this. And so I strongly believe in it. I think the important thing is what the result is. I once went, I, a couple of years ago, I went to two different institutes in Europe, and the heads of the institutes did the same thing to me. They both did the same thing, and they said, 
oh, we had a great year last year. We had so many percent of our papers that were in journals with an impact factor over some number. And I, I said, well, what was discovered? <laughs> what, was, what, was, what were the exciting results? And they couldn't really tell me. But they knew the numbers. So I, I'm very much against that. I think the importance is in the science. I did a little study of my own on this. I went to the Nobel Prize org website and I read through the biographies of everyone getting the medicine physiology prize for the last 25 years and all of the biologically oriented people that got the chemistry prize in that same period and I asked how many of them published in nature cell and science and about half of them did but the other half were in journals all over the map that you Sidney Brenner's uh, paper starting C. elegans genetics was in the journal Genetics. Bob Horvitt and John Solston's paper was in Developmental Biology. Uh, Roger Chen's paper was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Uh, there, there were papers in every imaginable journal. Uh, I think it's the content, not the numbers. You also said something about publishing and being pushed to publish. I think people do have to publish their results. I think it's important to get these things out so that other people can see the results and think about those results. So uh, I, I come down sort of in the middle on that. I, I think that people should be thinking about how they want to finish the story and then get on to the next story. Um, I would like to know how does GNP works in uh, alive minds? How can we see? So that's a good question, and, and one of the problems for those of you that don't work with fluorescence is that uh, mice are big. I mean, they're certainly bigger than those worms that I work on, uh, and you need, in order to activate GFP, you need to have blue light, and blue light doesn't penetrate into living tissue very far. So you can see things in skin, you can see things in the eye, you can see things, if you're interested in how cancer metastasizes, you can open up the animal and see where, where the cells have gone. But you can't see the working of the heart, for example, although people are working on other fluorescent markers and other fluorescent ways of doing this, because as you go further on the spectrum, if you go into the infrared, you can start to see things at a much deeper level and people are working on that. But there is this problem of the depth of it. So there are some problems that we cannot yet adjust to uh, in living organisms. I cannot go home without having the sensor. Do you have already at your lab a good fluorescent microscope? Please tell me. <laughs> Yeah, I sort of left that hanging, didn't I? Yes, we do. We, uh, right after the paper came out, I uh, contacted the company, I contacted my university, and I contacted my granting agency, and I said, I need a microscope. And they each put in one third of the cost, and we were able to get a nice microscope. So, uh, yes, we, we, we do. We, we, we do our own experiments now. We're still not using borrowed microscopes. although. We, we had to get a fancy microscope for another reason, and we sort of played around with this borrowing thing again. It's a, it's a good technique. <laughs> yes, fine. Hello, do you believe that a very strong multidisciplinary base is necessary for a biologist to be productive in his field? And if so, do you believe that there is an area that biology education you can neglect? So, uh, I always find this question a little bit amusing. I, I, I'm not trying to belittle you about it, but for the last 50 years, if somebody majors in biology, they have to take chemistry, they have to take physics, they have to take math, in addition to taking biology. So I think in biology, we've recognized the fact that we need to get as much input from as many places as possible. What I think is happening now, and I attribute it to the molecular biology revolution, is that suddenly there are questions that have opened up that 
we hadn't imagined could be working on, and we're attracting people from these other fields enormously to come in. People coming from physics saying, nah, that's an interesting question. I want to work on that. Or people from chemistry. So we are drawing in more and more people that have this expertise. I think whatever you learn is going to help you. I don't think that it's, there's anything I can say, oh no, don't learn that. That's not going to be of any use because I will be wrong. I, my, my predictive abilities are very, very bad. There was one more person up in the back. Yeah. É uma pergunta similar que foi feita por pela, uh, um similar anterior. Eu gostaria de saber uh, a respeito da autonomia da biologia hoje. Eu sou estudante de biologia da UNB e pode-se perceber que na, na, na pesquisa do senhor existem... Uh, uh, o senhor trata de biologia e o senhor ganhou um Nobel da Química e uh, as áreas científicas elas têm um, elas se cruzam, mas... É, Fala-se muito hoje da independência e da autonomia da, da, das ciências biológicas. Então, gostaria de ouvir a opinião do senhor a respeito. I, I have to tell you, I'm probably more surprised than anybody that I got a chemistry prize. Uh, that's, that's, that's the first part. Uh, I, and as you may know, I, 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 uh, I slept through the phone call. And, uh, I only discovered that I had actually won by looking online and seeing, I want to know who won and I saw my name and it was the chemistry prize and I periodically would go back after the next couple of months and see if they took my name off the list. But uh, um, I think that, I, I, as I said before, I think that, that biology right now is, is using every avenue it can, whether it's big data analysis, uh, doing whole genome work, uh, using new chemistry, using physics to answer questions that we've been trying to address for years. And an astonishing amount of work it progresses because of technology. I would say that GFP is a technology prize. We provided a tool as opposed to answers. And people were able to then go from that and use it in all the questions that they wanted to. Uh, and so I think that all of these things add in. And I, I really welcome people. I work, for the most part, on the sense of touch, where a cell is physically manipulated and then responds electrically. And while we know the molecules that are needed for that, we really don't know how the stimulation leads to an electrical signal. That's a physical problem. It's also sort of an engineering problem. I'm dying to have somebody come and work on that problem. So I think it's really good that we're attracting more and more people. I hope I answered the, the question. So uh, thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture. Eu, muito obrigado a todos pela presença. Acho que todos ficamos encantados pela apresentação. Obrigado e encerramos assim por hoje.